So, good morning. Good morning. And today we uh, we did our purification ceremony, which we do at the end of every month. That uh, that uh, <laughs> uh, prepares us to start over again. And uh, this, as part of this ceremony, we had our one longtime uh, member here. And I know you say, how do you become a member? Well, you come. Some centers, they have membership, right, Mary? And they charge money. And I tried that. ZCLA has that. They used to have like $25 for that. This is a long time ago. <laughs> it's not $25 anymore. And I thought, oh, I could raise some money and maybe pay the electric bill. And so I announced that to everyone. I said, you can become a member of the Zendo for $10 a month. And we'll put your name up, because ZCLA did that. You know, because we're selfless, and we don't ever think about any kind of any kind of reward. We just want to have our name on the wall that says we donate money, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we're not alone. Because I had a friend took me to a synagogue one time and showed me where her mother's name was up on the wall, and they do the same thing. You know, we just we just love that. Rob's got his name on the bell tower. He begged me for that. You know, I said, Rob, we don't, you know, we don't get into this uh, recognition thing. And he just said, I'll never do another thing around here if you don't put my name on that bell tower. <laughs> so, uh, today we, we uh, gave precepts to Clarissa, and uh, she came. Tell me again where you're living. Connecticut. Connecticut. I always think East Coast. Clar Clarissa is so far away that I'd never be able to ride my bicycle there. That's what I think. So she's in Connecticut. Uh, and uh, that was for your job, right? Yeah, so she went back there because she's an important person now. Always has been, but now everybody else knows she's an important person. And she uh, came up and uh, came out to California, and then she came up today to take her precepts and officially become a Buddhist. And this whole thing we do, we do a purification ceremony, and the idea is that no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we study, that we still keep stumbling across obstacles. And this is perfectly all right. I, I do not believe in the Zen practice of going and putting yourself in a hole in the side of a mountain. And, uh, Lots of stories about hermits that went out, put themselves in little huts on the side of mountains, and people would go up there every four to six weeks and uh, take them food and see if they're still alive. And if they weren't, then they'd bury them. And, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the myths that exists in, in Zen is that the founder of Zen, who was a fellow from India named Bodhidharma, had a beard. Because all of the artists display Bodhidharma with this big black beard. Well, have you ever seen Indians? They're the guys, they're like Greeks. They have to shave twice a day to look clean shaven because they have very heavy black beards. And that's who Bodhidharma was. So the pictures, like our picture down in, in our community room, we have a wonderful, and that's actually Vietnamese. A Vietnamese uh, artist did that Bodhidharma. And uh, so I took. The other Bodhidharma we have is in the cabin. And uh, that was an American that did that. So he's got all this hair up here and all that. That's because he was sitting in a cave. He was not sitting in a temple. He was sitting in a cave. And he sat there for a very long time until the second patriarch arrived and, you know, talked to him, will you be my teacher kind of thing. And so the monks would go and they'd shave his face and his hair which normally is done twice a month. But, you know, it might be every two or three months they would do it. And so he got this beard. And so there's this group of people within Buddhism that think that um, Bodhidharma had a beard. And he did only in the sense that he didn't shave very often. I have a Vietnamese friend that never shaves here. He only does it twice a month along with his head here. But of course, in America, we, we like nice, clean-shaven people. And so uh, 
my teacher used to shave you know his face every day and twice a month he'd shave his head uh, all cultural but I thought that was interesting uh, we do not require Clarissa to shave her face <laughs> nor does she have to shave her head which is one of the things great misunderstandings in the West oh you're becoming a Buddhist does that mean you have to shave your head and they don't realize that there are monks and then there are lay people so we do this purification and traditionally it has 108 vows in it and it's a good aerobic exercise and young monks like these over here during the 90 day training period every year they're supposed to do the 108 vows every morning along with reciting the 88 names of the Buddhas but we do this once a month and we do about 20 vows if anybody's counted them and, and uh, I can only do 20 because nobody will come if I do the 108. <laughs> oh, yeah. I used to stand at that door and look out at the empty parking lot going, okay, I'm doing something wrong here. <laughs> and uh, so within that poem that we use, which also is non-traditional, just so you know, because I've been accused of being very, very traditional in the way I do things. Um, but I had two un very non-traditional teachers. Tianan, on one side, was very traditional in the, the ceremonies we did, but then the things that he allowed, like he had monks that worked and all of that, and that would not be normal in, in any place uh, other than America. Although an awful lot of monks I've known, Korean, Japanese, and Vietnamese monks that came here and had to work just to support their temple, but they didn't let the lay people know they were doing it because they would get upset because monks aren't supposed to go out. You know, the great story is Suen Sansanim, who uh, fixed washing machines and laundromats. You know, that was his job. Now, I have no idea how he learned to do that. You know, went to washing machine school in Korea, arrived here and started fixing washing machines. But uh, within that long poem that we do, there is something that always jumps out, and, and it is um, the phrase of, I, I want to realize my Buddha nature, I want to return to my Buddha nature. And, and it's kind of a theme in there of wanting to realize the Buddha nature and wanting to return to the Buddha nature. And the monk that wrote this poem, great stuff in that poem. I showed it to a lot of people. I helped a monk turn it into vernacular English and you know there's still awkward spots in it which I always say if we ever redo the, the precept book I'll go in and I'll fix those but it was uh, it was dictionary English when I first encountered it and this abbot of the temple in Washington I went and led a retreat there and every day he would corner me and say so how does this look and I'd go well it's fine except nobody would understand what you're trying to say and so we worked it into vernacular English. And uh, just really not changing the poem, but coming across with a feeling for the poem. So the phrase, I want to realize uh, my Buddha nature, I want to return to my Buddha nature. Um, every time that we recite that, I want to return to my Buddha nature, I think of the 24-year-old movie star who's been in rehab for three times. You know, they have a really nice place down in Malibu where they can go. I've seen pictures in a magazine of it. I'd like to go there for a vacation. And they go to this place and they rehab. And uh, so they've done this, you know, two or three times. And somebody interviews them and says, you know, what do you think the problem is? Why do you keep getting in trouble? Well, I'm trying to find myself. And that phrase, trying to find myself, lots of art people use that phrase. Oh, I'm trying to find myself. No, you're trying to find the medium that works for you, that you can express what vision you have in your head. But see, that's too long to say. So you say, I'm trying to find myself. And I always think of, how did you lose yourself? Where did yourself go? Do you think you're somebody different than that grouchy old person? Or do you think you're somebody different that has a bad habit and you can't talk yourself into changing it? Is that who you think you are? 
or are you just who you are? And the Zendo is the place that we encounter ourselves, because it's really hard to make up stories in the Zendo. Now you can go to sleep in the Zendo. That works pretty good. You know, lots of people do that to go into the Zendo. I know they're doing that because I hear them snore. You know, mm -hmm. I used to sit next to a monk. Within five minutes of starting Zazen. <laughs> And, you know, finally, when I got enough guts, I'd go, Fred, Fred, huh, what, what, we done? <laughs> you know, so you can do that, but it's, it's really hard, and it's the purpose of retreats. You know, I, uh, Amer I think in America, Zen has really come of, of age, because there was a time when Americans thought that it was important to do a week-long retreat or it was important to be able to do 12 hours. I used to lead these retreats down in LA and the abbess never ever sat with us. And she'd say, so what time are you gonna start in the morning? I said, well, you know, get them up at 5.30 and start at six. So what time are you gonna get done? I said, ah, we'll probably get done about 10. Oh no, you're not getting enough hours of meditation. Well, what time do you want me to get done? I think 12 o'clock would be good. But she never sat with us, you have to understand. She never had sore knees. Okay, she did that when she was a novice, and once that was over with, she figured she had a green light never to do it again. So there was this notion that how long you sat was really, really important for your awakening, for your insight, for your aha. And there was also a notion of the more days you do in a row, the better that is. Well, my first hero was Gandhi. And I have nothing to say about Gandhi right now, except Sandy recently gave me another book about Gandhi. She, she's done that throughout the years, because she knows that Gandhi is my, my first childhood hero. I read his autobiography. And if you've not read his bio autobiography, go see the movie called Gandhi, because it follows his autobiography almost word for word. But then go read his autobiography, because it's worth reading. My second hero was a fellow by the name of Dogen, Dogen Keegan. And Dogen ended up going to China to find out about Zen. Now, Dogen had a problem, and his problem was, and, and actually the only monks in his time that were really doing a lot of meditation were Tendai monks. And he was doing meditation, he was studying the Lotus Sutra, and he got into uh, a dilemma of why do we need to do these things if we're already Buddha? Because the Lotus Sutra teaches Buddha nature, and it teaches that we already are Buddha. That's very different than I want to realize my Buddha nature, I want to return to my Buddha nature. If we're already Buddha, where, what are we returning to? And why don't we know it? And that was Dogen's problem. He, he couldn't understand why, why all this stuff was going on. And in the Tendai school, they had three practices. And it was a very old school, came over from China, and they said it almost the same, Tendai and Tendai. See, they almost sound the same, don't they? It's probably the only thing that came from China that the Japanese didn't completely change the name of. And they had three practices. They studied the Lotus Sutra, they performed religious ceremonies. That was a practice, and they meditated. So Dogen looked at all this stuff he was doing and said, I'm doing all this stuff. Why do I have to do it? Why don't I know who I am already? And so he started searching, and he left. And he became a monk when he was quite young. And he went off, and he studied with a monk by the name of Myozen, who was the direct disciple of the first monk to bring Zen to Japan. And uh, he was also a Tendai monk. And he just, Myozen decided to go to China because he just couldn't realize who he was. See, that's almost the same thing as I'm trying to find myself. And so they went to China to find themselves. And that's very difficult, you know, because it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to see your own shadow. And they went to a, a lot of different monasteries, and during that trip, Yozen died. 
And uh, Dogen went into a temple there and uh, studied with a Chinese master by the name of Zhu Qing, who was uh, one of the last masters in China of the Tung Dao school, which we know as the Soto school. And uh, they had a very simple practice. You sit on the cushion and you stay awake. Now, it took me years to understand why the Rinzai really didn't like the Soto, because some of the great masters in Rinzai said all they do is sit on the cushion and sleep and daydream. But Ju Qing said, you sit on the cushion, you stay awake. And in order to help you stay awake, he walked around the room uh, with his slippers, because the, the floors in, in the monasteries in China were either uh, concrete or they were slate. And that's kind of hard on the feet. And it's very cold in the winter. So the monks had clean shoes that they wore. And they still do that. They have clean shoes for the temple. Same thing in Vietnam. If you go in there, you might see the older monks wearing some kind of slippers. Those are only for inside. And he would walk around with an extra slipper and smack the monks in the side of the head when they were falling asleep. And he would yell at them. And one day he yelled at Dogen and he said, your body and your mind must fall away. And Dogen woke up. And then he uh, went to the master and said, my body and mind fell away. And the master said, that's wonderful. Dogen said, no, 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 you have to test me. And so the master said, so what did you experience? My body and mind fell away. Well, what's left? Gosh, you found yourself. You found the Buddha that you've been looking for. It was always there. When the Buddha woke up, after seven weeks of meditation under the bow tree, he looked up in the sky as the sky was lightning, getting more light, and he saw the morning star, Venus, and he went, ah, and he found himself. And when he found himself, he made a, he made a proclamation. He said, I and all the world am enlightened simultaneously, which means I just figured out we're all Buddha. I just figure out we all have the Buddha eye. We all have enlightenment. So what is the problem? Well, we're constantly getting in our own way. In Tianan's temple upstairs, where we went to the bathroom when people were meditating, there was a sign on, on the wall, and it was in about, oh, 10 point type so that you had to walk up to it to be able to read it. And it said, move. You're standing in your own way. So Clarissa today took precepts, and she got a new name, Ahimsa Muktika. The great potential of doing no harm. She already had it. Now, some people give names for attributes people already have. I don't do that. I give names to grow into. Because we always can grow into it. We can always be a little more kind. We can always put down all our problems. We can always get better. The big danger is to think that we've arrived, or the big danger is to think there's no place to go. All we do in the practice of Zen is put one foot in front of the other. And the most important thing is to walk out of the Zen building, the meditation hall, and continue doing the same thing in every activity we do. I'll ring the bell for this video, but he'll edit it out.